Welcome to the Red Light Report, your number one source for all things red light therapy, where you will learn how to optimize your health, wellness, and longevity with the power of photobiomodulation. I'm your host, Dr. Mike Belkowski. All right, everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Red Light Report. Today on the call, I have Dr. Carrie Jones, and she is an internationally recognized speaker, consultant, and educator on the topic of women's health and hormones. Dr. Carrie Jones, she graduated from the National University of Natural Medicine in Portland, Oregon, where she also completed a two-year residency in women's health, hormones, and endocrinology. Later, she graduated from Grand Canyon University's Mazer of Public Health program, and recently, uh, Dr. Jones became board certified through the American Board of Naturopathic Endocrinology. She was adjunct faculty for many years teaching gynecology and advanced endocrinology and fertility. And while in practice, Dr. Jones served as medical director for two large integrative clinics in Portland. She is currently the medical director for Precision Analytical Incorporated, creators of the Dutch test. And on top of all of that, Dr. Jones has a very large and devout audience on Instagram of (laughs) over 120,000 followers, where she is constantly putting out educational uh, hormone-related content with her own sassy flair. And if you (laughs) visit her page, you'll see what I mean. Without further ado, uh, Carrie, welcome to the Red Light Report. I love the addition at the end. That's that's amazing. <laughs> I had to mention that because because your flair. I mean, it just adds so much to it, and which oh I'm sure people will learn quickly. I I get asked a lot. How do you come up with the content? Like I hear this, I hear the audio, and immediately I go to hormones. I'm like, let's put personalities to hormones and put it makes it fun. Yeah, mm-hmm. for a topic that can be kind of I don't know um, tough for people to talk about or want to learn about, you make it quite fun and interesting. So that that probably plays a huge role into people wanting it to does. learn from you specifically. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it, hormones are overwhelming. I, you know, they're complicated and I, t- I joke all the time. They're like hurting cats and that's, that's a hard thing to do. So yeah. Well, with that being said, give us, give us your background story and really how you became so, I guess, infatuated with hormones uh, to the point that you're kind of one of the bona fide experts in the area today. <laughs> Well, first of all, thanks for having me on the show. I didn't, I didn't even start out with that. Let me, let me <laughs> remind myself of my manners. <laughs> <laughs> my pleasure as always. Yeah. Yes. I have always known since I was a little girl that I wanted to be a doctor. I thought I wanted to go more the OBGYN route. I was pre-med. I graduated pre-med from undergrad. I was volunteering in two different hospitals in the city I was into school with. And one of the volunteers was with a pediatric wing. It was very sterile. It was very conventional. It was very prescription surgery. And it was very warranted, right? Of course. Thank God we have it. And it wasn't me. I thought, gosh, if this is what I'm going to do the rest of my life, this sounds awful. And in the other hospital, I volunteered in their community outreach. And I worked with these two nurses who would do blood pressure checks and blood sugar checks. And they would talk about uh, nutrition and exercise out in the community. And I thought, this is what I want. I want this educational community-based medicine. So I decided not to go the conventional route. I moved to Portland, Oregon on a whim and found naturopathic medicine and realized that's what I wanted to do. So I, four years there, I pretty much focused in hormones. I did my, as you said, my residency is in hormones. And I realized that I really appreciated the hormones because as a female, there are a lot of things I didn't get taught, you know, in, in school, when we're young, my sex ed class was taught by our football coach. So you can imagine, and I went to school in the South, I'm from Kentucky. So you can imagine how awkward it was to get sex ed from the football coach. And I thought women and men too, but primarily I focus in women need to know this. They need to know this at a simple level. They need to know it about themselves. They need to be empowered because it's really hormones that, that drive us. And so that's what got me into hormones from a functional medicine point of view. Interesting. Yeah. I wouldn't want to learn even as a male necessarily from the football <laughs> coach. I imagine it could be relatively crass and uh, blunt and really not informational, I guess, but yeah, yeah it was interesting. Definitely, it was definitely interesting. Mm-hmm. Living in today's modern world, especially compared to, let's say even 50 to hundred years ago, we're living with different technology and we're inundating our body and our cells on a much different level than we ever have. And there's pros and cons to that. Of course, we're talking hundreds and hundreds of miles away through zoom, which is amazing. But again, there's somewhat of a price to pay. So from a hormone standpoint, what are some of the biggest culprits that we interface with because of this technology in the modern world? And and what are some things we can do to combat that? 
I say all the time for females in particular that our brain is constantly scanning to make sure we're safe enough and we're make sure we're healthy enough to have a baby. Whether you want to have a baby, it's sort of irrelevant. Um, I don't want to have a baby, but my body is constantly scanning that for my hormone production. And if I'm not safe enough and if I'm not deemed healthy enough, then my cycles will either be skipped or they'll be long or they'll be short or I don't ovulate or my PMS will be really bad because the brain is like, ugh, this isn't good. I'm going to shift things for you because t- this month is not the right month for fertility. Again, doesn't matter if you're trying to get pregnant. It's just the way the female s- brain scans. So then when we add technology into it, whether it's the wonders of Zoom or whatever it is going back and forth, whether it's the scariness of of 5G, whether it's uh, the fact that we have little devices, our phones that we are addicted to all the time, we're on social media, getting that constant feedback of the things we see, whether it's the scrolling, whether it's news, whether it's whatever, it definitely plays a role in the way our brain perceives the world and the way we perceive ourselves and everything from our energy to our sleep, you know, even just being on camera, being on computers, being on phones, like that bright white light, especially at night, disrupts our circadian rhythm. Ideas, thoughts, research behind 5G and what maybe that could be doing to the way our cells and brain. Um, even there's that report that just came out about holding our cell phones, you know, like right onto the ear, like how damaging that could be. There was a a study I read about years ago. This was before 5G. It must have been 3G. And they were using cow, uh, of course, cow brains. And they were having cell phones next to the cow brain. And then they were checking to see the temperature. Like how deep did that thermal heat go? And, you know, it went a lot further than you'd want it to go. And and we, as humans, you know, it's pretty kind of equivalent to maybe the thickness of, you know, skulls and and brains and whatnot. And so I thought, that can't be good. And since all hormones start in our brain, that's where the signaling cascade starts. The more we can do to protect our brain, the more we can do to protect our circadian rhythm. It's really important. So while we need this technology, we also have to do all the things to try to counter and help ourselves with this technology. That's a good point, especially bringing that research up with with the cow brains, because it is scary if if the research is showing that it's penetrating through the skull into the brain, mm-hmm. obviously causing uh, changes, detrimental changes to the to the brain at the cellular level, mm-hmm. that's going to wreak havoc on your hormones, your personality, your thought processes, and, and who knows what else. And with 5G, it's just the tip of the iceberg because we don't know what the ramifications yeah. are. So with technology in general, mm-hmm. it's it's progressing at an exponential level where we can't keep up with all the changes that may or may not be happen- happening to our body. So I guess it just behooves everyone to be proactive and mitigate all the potential dangers as much as possible for, for your entire body, but of course, hormones as well. Yeah. And I was looking at your, at your uh, website, drcarryjones.com, and on your homepage, you have a video where you discuss in an interview with Mike uh, Mutzel about why adrenal fatigue doesn't exist. So <laughs> the controversial I, topic. <laughs> yeah. So I'd just like for you to go into that with some uh, depth. For the audience here and explain why that may be the case that adrenal fatigue doesn't exist. So first of all, I want everyone to realize or understand or believe me when I say the symptoms of adrenal fatigue are very real. When somebody says to me, I'm completely burned out, I'm super tired, I can't get out of bed, I nap, I take a lot of caffeine, uh, I'm done, I fully believe you 100%. The title, the description adrenal fatigue is very sexy. It's very easy to say. It's very easy to write a book about. Um, But in reality, our adrenal glands don't fatigue out. There is an autoimmune condition called Addison's where we don't make cortisol anymore, but it's not a fatigue issue. It's an autoimmune issue. So aside from Addison's, the actual adrenal glands don't just shut themselves down. If you relate it to like women going through menopause, they are not like the ovaries. They don't just shut down. But what does happen, and a, the less sexier but more accurate title is HPA axis dysfunction. So hypothalamic pituitary axis dysfunction. So what happens is that the brain, there's a feedback loop. And so you probably had high cortisol at one point, And that high cortisol gets annoying to the brain. And the brain goes, that's it. Enough. I'm done. Stop making cortisol. And so the signal dries up and therefore the adrenals don't put out cortisol like it used to. And it goes down, down, down. And all of a sudden it's a low flat line for those people who have tested. 
So they get told you're in, oh my gosh, you're in full blown adrenal fatigue. So really you're in, you're in this HPA axis dysfunction. You are fatigued, but your adrenal glands are not, they are just not getting the signal. So is it similar to diabetics and um, kind of the feedback loop with insulin and glucose, where at some point your glucose is so high that the insulin uh, message no longer gets read or understood or whatnot. So it's similar yeah. in that sense where the feedback loop is more or less broken. Thus your, your body's not responding physiologically to the messages that it should, but it's, it's not a, that your adrenals literally. Yes. So it's a working. negative feedback loop. So even if you have a lot of stressors, even if you have a lot of external or internal stressors, because that it's called a negative feedback loop, because it's negatively affecting the signal. It's basically your lights are getting like on a dimmer switch, you're dimmer, you're like dimming down as opposed to being a full-blown like bright light. So you're getting dimmed down, even though you've got stress and you have a job and you have bills and you have the news and you have whatever going on inside of you, the dimmer switch is down so much because of that feedback loop that you're just not kicking out the cortisol that you need to. So you feel terrible. You, you're tired and you're burned out and you're, you know, not about it anymore. And that's really what's going on. So when people say, what do I do to get the adrenals quote back online? I'm like, well, actually we start at the brain. Now it could be for sure a mitochondrial issue, which I know you love the mitochondria, the mighty mitochondria as much as I do. Cortisol is actually produced, um, in the, in the mitochondria of the adrenal glands. You could, but for sure, get your brain signaling back on your, you know, your brain is healthy. You're doing all the things for your brain. But if God forbid, you also have mitochondrial issues, you are going to struggle at the adrenal level. But again, it's not fatigue. The adrenals aren't fatigued. You have sick, dysfunctional mitochondria, maybe even dying mitochondria. So the factory is just not able to pump out the cortisol. It just can't do it. So that makes total sense. And on top of it, like you're saying, if it's dysfunctional mitochondria, well, that alone is going to decrease your energy levels because the mitochondria is not going to be as efficient exactly with yeah. the ATP. So of yeah. course it's multifactorial. And just to reiterate the beginning of this whole process with quote unquote adrenal fatigue or the negative feedback loop is an overabundance of cortisol production, correct? Yes. So what yeah. are some of the key instigators for overabundance of cortisol? So cortisol is our fight or flight. So it's fight, flight, freeze, fawn, right? It's that whole system that's there to protect us. And we can fight or flight over just about anything nowadays. So it's that chronic stress, it's traumas, it's viruses. We call it like stealth or overt pathogen. So it can be a bug, a bacteria, worm, like I said, viruses, things like that. Mold, Lyme, it could be all of those things. It could be your job. You hate it so much. It stresses you out. It could be your relationship. It could be the house you are in, the amount of stuff you have on your plate. That is this all a divorce you're going through, right? Like it could literally be all those things. And some people will have one big stressor. They're like, oh my gosh, that makes sense. I got a promotion. I have 62 new things on my plate. I'm not accustomed to this. It completely burned me out. On the other hand, somebody might go, well, I don't have a big thing, but it's like low level all the time, never ending. Their tire blew on their car and then their kid got sick. And then, you know, like this happened. And then, the, you know, then the dog had to go to the hospital, the vet, you know, and then, and then they get in the fights with it. And so it's just all these chronic things. And after a while, the fight or flight system is continually putting out the cortisol among other hormones. And then kicks the brains like enough, 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 we're done. And it, it drops low. So I will often ask people, Hey, what was it like? Tell me about your three months ago. Tell me about your six months ago. Tell me about your year or two ago. And they will usually have either a big triggering event or lots of triggering events, external and internal that they'll go, Oh my gosh, you are not going to believe the story I'm going to tell you. And I'm like, Oh, okay. And here we are. So with that being said, if, if a lot of it is just like the fight or flight and a lot of it is external and we're responding to the external environment, all these different stressors, it could be anything like you mentioned. Yeah. How much can we fix with changing our mental aspect or like meditation or doing all these calming and relaxing practices, whatever it yeah. may be to help just flip the script and not respond as often or be stressed as much by these external events and just controlling our responses. How much of that can 
also control cortisol levels. It's a ton. Like that's what I love so much about talking about stress and cortisol because there are so many free, cheap, and easy ways to get your dimmer switch to come back on. Meditation and mindset is absolutely just one part of it for sure. And how you react to stress. I tell people I can't ever get rid of stress. It'll never happen. I mean, the world is just stressful, but everything you can do to help yourself become more resilient and work with your mindset or, or even have a meltdown, then like go for exercise or do meditation or do that, you know, your five minutes of breathing or, you know, snuggle your dog and get all that loving oxytocin, you know, like whatever you do to help you overcome what just happened in that moment, little moments through the day completely add up. I have a sign behind me, which is kind of blocked by my feather, but it says healing happens at joy. And so joy doesn't have to be one big thing. It doesn't have to be one big joyful event today. It's the little things. It's the funny meme that your sister sent you. You know, it's the funny thing that your kids said accidentally. It's when your dog chases its tail and falls over it. Like it's these little things that really add up. And that's just the mindset part. I mean, our brain is, like I said, is sort of the kickoff point. So even little things like get your shoulders out of your ears, right? Like stop walking around, stop slumping over in your chair on the couch or what have you. Because that, and looking down at your phone all the time, that forward head movement affects the way that we breathe and oxygenate the body. It affects the way that blood goes up and down, up into the skull and back down again, which is where our hormones ride around in our blood system, in our, in the circulation. And so it's our oxygen. Do you snore? Do you have sleep apnea? You know, do you mouth breathe? It's these things that add up to whether or not you're going to have healthy hormones. Obviously, big things can do it for sure. If you live in a moldy house and you have mold infestation, I mean, breathing alone is not going to help you. But as you're listening to this and if you're thinking to yourself, gosh, she's right. I totally slouch in my chair. I stare down at my phone all the time. I have, I'm so stressed out. My shoulders are in my ears. I'm not finding joy. Like I'm, I'm reactive a lot because I don't, I don't have a, a, like a valve to let go of steam. Then that it's these things that do add up to help improve the cortisol system. The system is meant, isn't meant to fail. Like it really wants to protect you. So we can, we can get it back on track. And that's a good point. That last part about we have cortisol for a reason, just yeah. like you don't want zero inflammation. We have inflammation for a reason. It's a, mm -hmm. it's a red flag saying something's happening, but when it becomes chronic, of course, yeah. that's when we see issues. And, and like you were mentioning, there's so many really free ways to reduce cortisol levels, reduce mm -hmm. your stress, which is amazing. Same thing with red light therapy. You don't need a fancy device to get red light and to get the positive benefits of red and near infrared light. So like you were mentioning, being able to reduce cortisol and really just assessing like you went through, you know, very articulately, assessing your own environment, assessing your daily habits. What are you doing? And what's one thing that you could change? Is it that tense upper, tense upper traps that you could just mm -hmm. relax? Is it that deep breathing, which could help with that? Your posture? Are you submersing yourself in negative social media or high intense, stressful movies and books and shows like all these things, can you mitigate them? Can you reverse them? And simply in your daily habits, help reduce your cortisol levels. Um, yeah. And of course, a large part is, you know, and you already alluded to this is the circadian rhythm. Mm -hmm. What can you do to normalize that? And that alone will help with the cortisol and the stress Huge. levels. I mean, it helps with everything, of course. It, so yeah. when you assess them, when you have a patient, you've already kind of gone through it, but what does it look like when they walk in and you kind of assess what they're dealing with and then what treatments could they potentially see from you? Usually, so I obviously like, like everyone, I'm taking a thorough history, what's going on, right? What, how are you feeling? What's your chief complaint? And then, and then give me the timeline. Talk to me about the last several years. Tell me about your upbringing, your, your family, your, the family you grew up with, the current family that you have, all these things. So I'm getting a, a whole history to try to piece together. When did it fall apart? When did you start noticing that things are really starting to fall apart? I also ask questions such as, in the morning, how long does it take you to feel alert and ready? It's my cheater question for cortisol. When you have healthy levels of cortisol, first thing in the morning, within about 30 to 45 minutes of you opening your eyes and waking up, your cortisol should go up really pretty steeply, like a mountain. So it goes straight up, and then it'll gradually decline through the rest of the day. So you technically should feel alert, ready to go, and not need caffeine within that 30 to 45 minutes. But a lot of people say, oh my gosh, don't talk to me until I have coffee. Like, don't talk to me until I have two cups of coffee. You have to give me at least two hours. Like, well, you do not have a good cortisol awakening response because ideally 
as a human, you should be able to get up, be moving, be alert within 30 minutes. And the coffee part is the bonus. It's like you enjoy your coffee as opposed to relying on it to get through your day. So I also test. I'm a big believer in testing. Full disclosure, I am the medical director for a hormone lab called Dutch Test, which is owned by Precision Analytical. But even if you don't use the Dutch test, some sort of cortisol testing I'm doing throughout the day because I want to know what is your circadian rhythm. Cortisol is like the sun. It should go up in the morning. Melatonin is like the moon, right? They flip. So cortisol is up, gradually goes down. And as you get close to night, melatonin goes up and then gradually goes down as you get close to waking. So I want to know, do you have a typical normal rhythm? And if you don't, we're going to work on fixing that rhythm. If you flatline, Do you go up at night and that's why you can't sleep? Do you bottom out in the afternoon and that's why you crave sugar and more caffeine or a nap? So I want to see these things to assess individually, what am I going to do with you? Now, as far as treatment goes, the absolute number one thing that I recommend um, is because of these little nifty little genes we have in our brain, they're called the clock genes, just like the clock on your wall. And so the clock genes are the master clock for your whole body. They set your rhythm. In fact, they set and reset it. Humans are a little longer than 24 hours. The clock on our phone and our computers and our wall is a 24-hour clock, but our humans are a little longer. So the clock genes need uh, light to set themselves and darkness to reset themselves. And I say this a lot. Notice I did not say ashwagandha. I did not say intermittent fasting. I did not say, you know, cold plunges, love all those things, but that's not the primary thing the clock genes want. The clock genes like light in the morning, darkness at night. And the number of humans that I see that get in bed in the morning, they get on their phone. So it's that fake blue light, or they just lay there. They, you know, go get coffee and they kind of shuffle around. Um, instead I'm like, Hey, when you get up, I want you to seek out full spectrum light, open a window, like literally open the window or slide it up, whichever way your window goes. Mine opens like this way. (laughs) Open your slider door, go out on your balcony, go out on your deck, go in your backyard, walk your dog first thing. 10 minutes, don't look at the sun, don't burn out your retina, don't be stupid. But getting that full spectrum light, um, even on a not sunny day, just the brightness, the lightness, the light, even a, a bright gray day is great. At night, do the opposite. You want to wind down, you want darkness, start to dim the lights. Don't watch super scary documentaries on your TV. Be careful on your phone. And if you are going to do these things, wear blue light blocking glasses, put your phone into some sort of orange or red background mode, um, and then sleep in complete darkness at night. Because these are the just the basic stuff that I think a lot of people are getting wrong. There's they're bright light all night long. They're on Netflix. They're on their computer. They're on their phone. They're in bed on their phone, and then they're then they're struggling with sleep. Maybe they can't fall asleep. They can't stay asleep. Their hormones are off, and it's because of this messed up circadian rhythm. This podcast was brought to you by the Longev Revive Cream. If you haven't heard of this cream before, go back and listen to the podcast interview with David Horanek, one of the people that helped create this amazing cream. The cream was specifically developed to enhance red light therapy treatment sessions, and not only that, but improve vibrational healing from the frequencies of full spectrum sunlight. The Revive includes special ingredients such as photodynamic amino acids, which helps convert UV light to red light. It increases production of this thing called fibronectin, which is said to be the holy grail of anti-aging. And then there's astaxanthin, which has been shown in clinical studies to increase skin moisture, moisture retention, and elasticity. There's turmeric, which contains an antioxidant, anti-inflammatory, and antimicrobial properties. There's copper peptides, which also has antioxidant, anti-inflammatory effects. C60 has high antioxidant power to prevent skin aging, 172 times more than vitamin C. And then there's also geranium rose, shungite, humic acids. And most of these ingredients are organic and they're all high, high quality. So if you want to check this cream out, go to longev.com. That's L-O-N-G-E-V-V.com. Or you can also find it on biolite.shop. That's biolite.shop. And you're saying without a shadow of a doubt, the number one way you can throw it out of alignment in circadian rhythm, or you can bring it back into alignment is through your light environment. Or I was going to say like our moms, our dads, our entrepreneurs, what do they do? They put the kids down to bed. They get a second wind. They have a few hours to themselves and they have light on. They're on their computer. They're checking email. They're doing the last thing. They're responding to their team. They're going through social media at night. 
And then they'll like, I can't sleep. I don't sleep that well. And I wake exhausted on my end. Cause I work for a hormone lab. These are the people that I see their cortisol go up at night instead of down because they're doing the opposite. The clock genes are like, all right, fine. If you're going to be around bright light, I guess we're going to just stay up and give you more cortisol, more norepinephrine, more epinephrine, which is adrenaline. And then, and then we get into, you know, one night, two nights, like we're human, of course, resilient. We can do that. You need to do it like once a week or something. Fine. It's the long term That's the issue. It's the people that are like, oh my gosh, I'm burning the candle at both ends for months. I have to get this project done. I have to get this thing launched. I have to do that. I'm like, no wonder you don't feel good months later. No wonder you're so tired months later. The candle is burned. When that blue lit technology, especially like you're saying at night, well, at any time, you're giving your body, you're giving your eye and your brain the signal Mm -hmm. that it's the middle of the day. So like you said, of course, you're going to increase cortisol levels and there's that reverse relationship uh, with melatonin. So Mm -hmm. your melatonin and cortisol can't go up at the same time. So if you're giving your your eyes and that your brain, that blue lit technology saying it's, it's the middle of the day, your melatonin has nowhere to go but down, which obviously <laughs> helps with sleep. But of course, there's a lot of rest and recovery and repair and growth mm-hmm. that happens at night, which can't happen nearly as well without that melatonin production. So men make testosterone at night. There was yeah. a research study. It's very small, but still they took young men and they cut their sleep by a couple hours every night. And they've noticed that after just a couple of weeks, their testosterone production went down like 10 to 15% just within like two weeks of, of being only getting, I think they cut their sleep to five hours. They cut their sleep to five hours a night. And I thought to myself, gosh, I know a lot of men who only get five hours a night because they're up working. They're up gaming, you know, they're up on TV. Like they're, they don't sleep that well. And, and then over just a matter of weeks, their testosterone production is going to go down. Because you need to go to sleep to make testosterone. And for some people, it's almost a sense of pride that I don't need as much sleep as you, yes. or I'm more productive, or I'm more efficient because I only need three, four, five, six hours of sleep. But obviously, there's negative ramifications of that. In the short term, uh, they definitely, you know, I get it. In the short term, they may need it to start a business or to maintain a business or new baby, right? Like, there's a lot of reasons you you do need to subside on very low amount of sleep for a while. But I, those people usually do end up either in my office or at my lab because they can't, you can't do that forever and feel a game. Right. Short term. I mean, what's your return on, I guess, ROI, return on investment of losing sleep is it going to be worth it in the short term. Right. Like you're saying, if you're starting a business, if you're trying to raise uh, a newborn, but you can't do it chronically because right. you're just going to wreck yourself, burn, burn yourself at both ends of the, of the candle there. Right. And I wanted to circle back because you mentioned blue light blockers and of course dimming your screen to to orange mode versus full-blown blue light so if you're doing both of those things how much are you saving yourself or how much are you stopping that raise in cortisol and lowering in melatonin is that really a a fix-all if someone wants to be working late at night or um early early in the morning I find it. So the research is mixed. Definitely. The research is mixed. It's not like solid. Yes. If you wear blue light blockers, you're going to negate all the light effects on cortisol. But I would say I have blue light blockers myself, hundreds of people. I have lots and lots of feedback anecdotally of people who have added in blue light blockers at night or as they get into the evening, notice a massive difference in their, either their eye strain, their sleep, their recovery, their heart rate variability, all these things. But what I do tell people is just because you have blue light blocking glasses doesn't give you the go ahead to do all the bad habits. They call it biohacking. So there, I think there's like better biohacking. And then there's like, you're just doing that to get away with your bad habit, which is burning the candle at both ends. So sure. You need to use blue light blocking glasses sometimes through the week because you really want to watch this show. You're watching them movie with your significant other. You've got to finish this report and it like, you're going to be up late. Fine. Do it. But if it's your constant crutch so that you can use and abuse your body, then I'm not a fan of it. Then I'm like, ooh, we have to get to the root cause, which is you're using and abusing your body. So I don't want you to do that. Yep. I agree. It can be a crutch, but you can also use it appropriately um, to help mitigate the potential negative effects uh, of the blue light. One more thing about hormones before we get into some light therapy, red light therapy, Yay. Um, is is diets because seems like there's fad diets that come and go. There's pros <laughs> and cons. What do they do with your hormones? So especially the keto diet, and mm-hmm. I learned and read about it and utilized it when I was in physical therapy school five, six, seven, eight years ago. At this point, 
And initially I got this amazing, consistent surge of energy. There's a lot of pros. You lose a lot of fat. It allows you to go longer without eating, theoretically, all this good stuff. But as the years have gone on and more research has come out, there's evidence to prove that you don't want to be on keto diet all the time. Mm -hmm. It may be a good starting point. Um, If anything, it's an an elimination diet, meaning you're cutting out a lot of foods that you were having, which will help reduce inflammation, help lose water weight, all that good stuff. But yeah. long term might actually wreck, not wreck, but be detrimental to your, your body and hormones. Some sources say that the keto diet can improve estrogen levels. Some sources say that the uh, keto diet can decrease and wreck your estrogen levels. So right. uh, what's, what's the scoop on that? <laughs> uh, the scoop on it is extremely controversial. And I do find with the keto diet, it much... I find it works much, much better for men, and I find it very mixed in women. And I should clarify specifically cycling women. So I find that my menopausal women and my and men seem to just do okay being keto. I don't necessarily recommend it forever, but you know, if you're if you are using it to lower inflammation is part of a fat loss journey to identify some things, you know, like I'm like, okay, cool, I'll do it for one to three months, you know, one to whatever, four months. And, and do that. But what I do see are the women who, uh, because women's hormones literally cycle, we have our period and then our estrogen goes up and it, by itself. And it's supposed to go up because it triggers, helps trigger ovulation. And then it comes down and then it comes up again, but only like a bunny hill as opposed to a big hill. And then progesterone comes up like a big hill. So again, it's this like up and down of our hormones. So what I find is that women who are keto all the time throughout their cycle, they tend to or can really struggle hormonally, especially in the second half of their cycle. Their PMS, their ability to ovulate, their ability to make progesterone. We like progesterone. Progesterones are calming, are soothing, are relaxing hormone. It counters estrogen. Over time, that can be really affected. And so some of the, like, the female keto, even athlete experts that I follow are more in the camp of if you do keto, only do it two, maybe three weeks of the month. And then as you get close to your period, start to add in some starchy carbs so that you can sustain the progesterone production. You can abate cravings. You don't kill anyone with your PMS. And then when you go back to your, when your period starts, you can like get yourself back in more into a, a ketogenic state. And it's interesting because I've posed the question on social media how did you do with keto? And it was all across the board. And again, I don't, I don't know their backgrounds. I don't know if they really did keto. I don't know if they did it for a day. I don't know if they did it right. I don't know if they saw an expert to help them, but it was definitely women who were like, loved it, lost weight three months, but man, it screwed up my periods. And others are like, hated it, you know, tried it for a week. I was awful. Others are like, love it. I continue to do it. It's been the best thing ever. My body, according to my genetics, is wired for keto. I'm supposed to do well with fasting. I'm supposed to eat very, very, very little carbs. I have tried keto multiple times, and I am not pleasant to be around (laughs) when I am in ketosis at all. So uh, it's to my husband's best interest not to allow me to go into ketosis very often. So even though genetically I'm supposed to be wired to, to do that, I just have tried keto so many times and I'm like, why, why am I continuing to do this? So I will be, me personally, I will be on the keto, more keto end in the first part, the follicular phase uh, before ovulation, knowing carb choice is important as I get older and insulin resistance And then I add in more carbs as I get closer to my period. So with any plan, with any eating plan, I don't have a definitive like, oh, it's the best for women. That's going to raise your estrogen. That will guarantee you ovulation. That will totally make you have a baby. Like, no, even on paper, you could be told what diet's the right one for you. And then you try it and you're like, this is awful. This isn't working. Well, that's interesting. Why is there such a mismatch if your genetics say one thing, but in reality, or at least when you try and utilize it, it doesn't work for you. I honestly have no idea. No idea. One of the things I strongly suspect is that I have a problem. I was told by one genetic expert, he was like, you have a problem with vitamin B6 and vitamin B6 is super, super important in hormone production, a lot of hormone production. And, um, you get B6 from carbohydrates. So even though I'm supposed to be very low carb, if not keto, According to my genetics, he's like, you also have this other issue over here where you don't do very well. You do, inherently don't make very, so I could take, I could just take vitamin B6, uh, the active form is P5P for the rest of my life, which I do take extra B vitamins. I do feel better with them, but 
from the carb point of view, I think between the B6, the serotonin, the nourish chain, I just feel as a female better, especially as I get close to my cycle. So I have to take my cycle into consideration with my genetics. Once I become menopausal, maybe it'll be completely switched. Maybe I'll be a ketogenic extraordinaire, you know, a keto queen as I go through and then because my hormones won't matter. Well, that's a good point. Like diets should change throughout your lifespan because your body and your physiology requires different nutrition or nourishment through different phases of life. So that's a good point that, and again, the keto diet may work for you now, but like you're saying, it might not later or it might not now and it might later. So that's a good point. And that your whole uh, diatribe there was on point because you're basically saying that there isn't a diet for everyone or Mm -hmm. you need to test different diets out. If you hear an influencer talk about vegan and it works so well for them, and then you try it, it does not mean it's going to work for you. It right. may, but yeah, so so it pays dividends to, you know, if you're trying to go down this health path um, diet specifically, to of course, learn about various diets, try them out, see how your body responds um, and take it from there. And don't beat yourself up if an influencer found massive success or even their comment section is full of massive su- success and it wasn't successful for you. It, it's just you. There's nothing wrong with you. It's just your makeup and requirements and, you know, whatever it is, hormones, it's just not the right one for you. But then you'll find somebody else who's doing a different plan and that one is completely works for you. And then that's fantastic. If I had stuck to all the, all the keto experts and influencers and and educators and what have you, man, I would have felt super disappointed. Like I must be failing this. I must be really, really failing this because I am hungry all the time, uh, no matter what I'm eating. And everyone's, oh, just eat more meat. Yo, how much more of the cow can I eat? Like, it's getting ridiculous. And I was still hungry and I was still moody. And I thought, screw this. I'm not doing this anymore. Well, then when you get frustrated, there goes the story with cortisol. So, yeah. <laughs> um, you know what I mean? So it could just be a vicious yeah. cycle. So yeah, there, there's another instance where just controlling your emotions, understanding the health journey is that it's a journey. It's not going to mm-hmm. be perfection just because you flip the switch from, from your diet from one to another, it's right. a journey. We're always learning. The research is always evolving to some people that can be frustrating, fatiguing, because you're always having to keep up with, yeah. with the information, but just understanding that's a journey. You're doing the best you can with the information you have now. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, don't get stressed out if something doesn't work or doesn't work as well as, as it did for someone else. Yeah. Yep. Let's move on to the mitochondria and, yeah. and or red light therapy. So give us, Give us a a quick um, synopsis of your take on mitochondria, how you utilize different things, whether it's supplements or light or whatever, to optimize your mitochondria. And then then after that, we can get into some red light therapy. I love the mitochondria. I got really interested in the mitochondria uh, because, well, it's where that's the first step of all hormone production, sex hormone production. But I had a person on social media say to me, Dr. Jones, I'm so disappointed that you are jumping on the mitochondrial bandwagon. I wish you would just continue to stick to talking about the adrenals. And I was like, oh, you don't understand. It's the mitochondria in the adrenal cells that are making the cortisol or in the ovarian cells that are making the sex hormones or what have you. It's down to that microscopic level. That's the organelle that that does does it all. So we all, we, we learned in school that the mitochondria are our cellular powerhouses because they make our ATP, but your testosterone, your progesterone, your estrogens, your cortisol, the first step of production is the mitochondria in the cell. And then when the first step happens, everybody slides over to the endoplasmic reticulum. So the endoplasmic reticulum is also very important, but cortisol comes back. Cortisol comes back to the mitochondria to finish out its grand butterfly awakening, and then goes out into circulation as cortisol. So if you are having any kind of dysfunction in your mitochondria, especially at the adrenals, you're going to struggle with DHEA and you're going to struggle with cortisol and you're going to struggle with aldosterone and, and these other hormones, because that's where, that's where the magic happens. That's where it takes place. So all things mitochondria, whether I'm talking about, you know, the free radicals, whether I'm talking about, you know, how mitochondria are super smart and they can, if there's broken pieces in a mitochondria, they can cut it off. Like if its arm is broken, it can just be like, not a problem. And it will cut its arm off and let its arm float away and get taken care of. But now it's missing an arm. So it will seek out a mitochondria with an arm and then they can fuse together. And it's called biogenesis, another bigger, better, awesomer mitochondria. 
with a functioning right and left arm. And so I, the mitochondria, I think, are very, um, they've evolved over a long, long, long time. And they're pretty intelligent, but man, are they sensitive. They are high. I thought I was high maintenance. Mitochondria are high maintenance. And they're affected by everything. They're affected by, you know, toxicants. And they're infected by viruses. They're affected by mold. They're affected by lack of sunlight. They're affected by just, you know, dehydration and lack of oxygen and all this stuff. And so we have to love on our mitochondria on the regular, which is why it's part of my mitochondria help that I do throughout the day. You know, the, the red light, my bio light is part of that. I just think every time when I stand in front of my bio light, I'm like, come on, mitochondria. <laughs> on, <laughs> <were>. C. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, like you said, the mitochondria are essentially environmental, uh, sensors. Yeah. If your environment isn't in check, if, if there's this 5g floating around, if you're stressed, if, if you're, uh, running from a lion, constantly your, your mitochondria is going to let you know. And the yeah. thing is maybe not immediately, but over, it can be over time. Mm-hmm. You're not going to see, uh, uh, let's say wrinkly skin from excessive UV light overnight. It's going to be repetitive injury, if you will. Yeah. But at the same time, like you said, the mitochondria is very resilient, very smart. They want to thrive. They want to return to that state of homeostasis. So if you give them what they want, there's a lot of conditions that you can mitigate, prevent, and even reverse when you give the mitochondria what they want. And one of the big ones is that red and near infrared light. Mm -hmm. So what have you noticed since using red light therapy? Do you um, suggest it to your patients? I do. Do you see any results? Um, Kind of give us some- some, And practitioners. (laughs) Yeah. Well, let's see some of the results you've seen yourself and then with with other people. Uh, For me, it's been definitely like energy, mood, even just hormones. So I, I tend to, in the morning, I will work out And then I will make, I don't drink coffee, but I'll make green tea or black tea. And then I will stand, I have one of the panel. So I will stand in one of the, in front of my bio light and then listen, you know, have music or a podcast or something going on. And then I'll go meditate. And I always just feel better. And I live in Portland, Oregon, and it rains a lot. Not this summer. We're in a horrible drought, but typically we have a lot of gray, rainy, awful days. And just standing in front of the light and getting that feeling throughout my body, I just, I think it just helps immensely, even with seasonal affective disorder and just like lack of light because it's just been helpful. I'm not currently seeing patients. However, I talk to a lot of practitioners all over the globe about hormones. That's one of my jobs is consulting. And, um, a lot of times I'm explaining the mitochondria and they're like, Oh, I don't want, I'm tired of taking things. I don't want to take things all the time. I'm like, get red and near infrared light. It's wonderful and it can be, you can pinpoint it or you can full body it and it can be really, really helpful. And actually, I I don't remember if I told you this, but I'd hurt my hip doing some kind of workout and I have the little one, like the one that you have behind your shoulder and I just stuck it in my yoga pants over my hip and like after one session, it, the pain was significantly decreased. And so I'm like, this is great. And I remember telling a girlfriend of mine and uh, who's also a doctor And she's like, you just put it on your skin. I was like, yeah, I didn't ask him if I was allowed to do that. I just put it in the yoga pants and man, it worked great. And so she did. She was like, oh my gosh, I hurt my knee. So I just folded, you know, unfolded my Mm -hmm. yoga pants over the, over the device, over my knee. And it helped a lot while I sat at my desk and I was like, yeah. Well, with a shine, the the handheld device, you certainly can put that directly on your skin because there aren't any EMFs because it's not plugged into electricity. It just runs on an internal battery. but. Even in the case where you have a panel, you don't necessarily need a touch in your skin, but you can get pretty darn close because I think you would agree that if you can get immediate relief and rid of pain, that's probably going to be worth the six or eight minutes of a little bit of EMF emission. But but regardless, those are cool stories because it's very real. You had pain, you used red and near infrared light, and then it was significantly reduced if not gone. Yes. Or I was low energy and stood up in my light and felt way better, much better energy after the fact. Well, so I have a little piece of research I wanted to kind of bring to everyone's attention, and especially yours, Carrie, because this has to do with uh, dysmenorrhea. So I want to get your perspective on this. It's a a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled pilot trial from 2012, so a little while ago, but the results are kind of interesting. The results are that all 21 subjects in the active photobiomodulation group, we'll just call it PBM from here, um, reported either complete pain relief or significant reduction in pain of their dysmenorrhea. 
all women who underwent active PBM showed a 50% reduction in VAS scores, and that's visual analog scale. It's a, a pain from one to 10. And they had, so they had a 50% reduction in their pain scores during their first or second menstrual cycles after active PBM treatment, which was clinically significant. So the, uh, the study said that the result also carefully suggests that the cause of dysmenorrhea might not be the abnormal production of bioactive substances, such as hormone imbalance, um, a decrease in serotonin levels or excessive prostaglandin production, but might be the abnormal function of smooth muscles in the mm-hmm. uterus. So they're suggesting that it's the tense muscles versus uh, potentially the, these hormones causing uh, dysmenorrhea. And so their findings suggests that smooth muscles in the uterus might be relaxed enough to restore normal smooth muscle function through extended uh, dose. And so the conclusion was they used skin adhesives uh, for this particular study. So their conclusion was skin adhesive PBM administered to acupuncture points might be uh, an effective, simple, safe, non-pharmacological method to treat uh, for the treatment of dysmenorrhea. So what are your thoughts on that? Does that make sense? So, um, well, my thought was if you have smooth muscle dysfunction, like it has to start from somewhere because they don't have cramps all month long. Right. So, I mean, unless it's endometriosis, then you really could be right in pain all month long. But if it's just dysmenorrhea around your cycle, then prostaglandins for one histamine for two tend to go up. Prostaglandins cause things to spasm or squeeze. And so it's trying to get you to have a period. You get start to get cramps because it's like, all right, cool. Let's like, let's like squeeze the wall here. And so you can shut off your, 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 the blood, the tissue and everything. But unfortunately also your histamine can go up in this process and, and both can cause smooth muscle spasm. So while I would agree with the smooth muscle part, there's a reason you have dysfunctional smooth muscle, I would guess, regardless, I think that's amazing that by using photomodulation that it's going to help. Cause if you, anything you can do to relax and sort out that smooth muscle, then it's going to help re- reduce cramps. Gotcha. That makes sense. So you're saying that the, uh, the smooth muscles are like hypertonic or tight yes. because of dysregulated hormone imbalances or what have you, that the red light comes in. That would be my guess. We know from photobiomodulation research that it can cause vasodilation, which would improve circulation, which would right. relax the smooth muscles. Um, but again, to your point, the cause of the smooth muscle tightness may not be or the large role may be because of hormone imbalance. That would be my guess. Like, I wouldn't think the smooth muscle would just be random or right, somebody gotcha. is just born with dysfunctional smooth muscle hypertonicity. And even with endometriosis, that's not the cause that happens, but that's actually, and same with adenomyosis. Gotcha. Adenomyosis is when the inside glands actually accidentally grow backwards into the uterus. And those women can also have a lot of cramping and bleeding. There's a cause Yep. Otherwise you'd be in uterine pain all the time, right? You'd have smooth muscle pain all the time. So there's, so that would be my argument is like, well, something caused the dysfunction. So fantastic that the light can help. Something as simple as light, non-invasive, yeah. safe. If it can, yep. if it can reverse the process. And I've talked about this with other people, whether it's on the podcast here or otherwise, even if it was a placebo effect, but let's say your uterine pain was gone, would it matter? Yeah. Whether or not the red light therapy is directly affecting the hormones it's leading to results. So, I mean, yeah. like you're saying, this research article may not be completely on point with what's going on, but to your point, um, regardless, there there is a it's working. pretty cool results. Yeah. It's so, very cool results because cramps can be absolutely uh, debilitating, right? As we hear from our patients. What's the typical form of treatment for that? Is it pharmacological intervention? Or? That's what conventional does. Yes. Yeah. Conventional will either do pain medications. They will put them on the birth control pill. Sometimes they will tell you it's in your head and they will put you on antidepressants. Sometimes they tell you just take ibuprofen and welcome to be a woman, which is crap. That's generally the conventional route. And so, and then, you know, women figure out over the years, like the like heat, heating pads, baths, we sort of figured this out on our own. And then there's a whole sort of functional medicine aspect to it, which evaluates a lot deeper, but yeah, unfortunately conventional medicine is here's the pill. And I, again, yeah, I'm not talking yeah. like severe endometriosis, even though they still recommend the pill for endometriosis, but for everyday cramps, I do hear this. Here's it. Here's pain medication. Here's the pill. Here's an antidepressant. Good luck. Yeah. yeah. Last thoughts before we sign off here. If, if people are kind of on the fence with, with red light therapy, whether it's hormone women's health or otherwise, what would you tell them? What would your suggestion be? to nudge um, towards red light therapy. 
or what oh would my you gosh. just tell them in general? <laughs> well, I, I mean, I think it helps that I personally have two of the devices, right? I have a panel and then I, and then I have the shine and love them. It's really, honestly, it's really nice not to have to take a pill, even though pills are convenient, but sometimes it's really nice just to have that six, eight, 10 minutes where I'm standing there with my tea rotating like a rotisserie chicken <laughs> in front of my panel and just get that instant relief or that instant boost or that instant feel better. And not a lot of time it, and it's just part of my keep my mitochondrial healthy plan. And we're talking mitochondria with cortisol, but like I said, mitochondria help. They do stuff all over the body, like all over the body, of course. And so if you're struggling with any kind of hormonal thing or energy thing, even immune system thing, like getting your mitochondria sorted out can be a really big part of the picture. And by having the red light, you're part of your plan, part of your, part of your toolbox. Yep. And it's easy. You, you stand there and bask in the gloriness of the red light. <laughs> and like you said, you literally like, just stand there. <laughs> yeah, and like you said, you can multitask in the sense of doing some breathing exercises or listening yeah. to a podcast or meditation or whatever. So it yeah. is kind of a nice uh, little routine and you can add um, whatever other health habit or biohack you want to kind of yeah. uh, stack them. Yeah. Or if you get the shine, then, you know, you can just, you can have it focus places where it hurts or on your face or, yep. you know, things like that. You can pinpoint if you've got aches and pains in places that you would just like to focus there, that's really nice. And I was saying in the beginning, I have my stand is right here, but my shine, mine is charging downstairs. <laughs> but it's always a good desk. thing. It's ready to rock and roll. Yeah, exactly. Your shine is charging, so it can charge your mitochondria. Exactly. That's its job. Yep. I even take it when I travel. Absolutely. That's the cool thing about the shine. It's it's uh, perfect for spot treatments, but especially on the go. I haven't used. I've used it multiple times on my uh, a puppy, which. I was thinking if I was trying to use a panel, it'd be much more cumbersome to try to angle and hold that panel towards my puppy. Whereas the shine, you can just hold it in your hand and be much more specific with your treatment. So yeah, it is quite versatile. Yeah. All right, Carrie. Well, lastly, where can people go to learn more about you and more from you? <laughs> Instagram. I hang out on Instagram the most. I am at dr.carrie Jones and everything I do on there is educational, education-based because I want people to understand hormones and how they work and feel empowered. And you do that in a fun, sassy way. And uh, <laughs> you, you make it fun. So everyone who's listening, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So go check, go check her out at dr.carrie Jones on Instagram. And also she has her website, drcarriejones.com and the Dutch test.com, which we didn't mm -hmm. get to talk about much today, but maybe in a, a subsequent podcast, we could dive into that a little deeper. Yeah, absolutely. Um, My favorite test. Yeah. <laughs> but Carrie, appreciate the time, appreciate your knowledge and expertise and sharing with the audience today. Any last words or um, I guess one thing I'd like to ask also is what are one or two things that people can do today to start optimizing their health or hormones yeah. going forward? So, well, first of all, thanks. Thank you for having me. This It's always fun as usual talking with you. Um, I would go back to the light in the dark. It's what the clock genes want. They're, the, while the intermittent fasting or ashwagandha or breath work or whatever you do is great at their core, they are set and reset. The biggest setters and reset are light and darkness. So give them what they want. Get up in the morning, go outside, get five or 10, 15 minutes of full spectrum light around you. And at night, do the opposite. Sleep in complete darkness, wear a sleep mask, wind down at night, be in that dark environment. And in, after a couple of weeks, it can really make a difference. Perfect. Optimize your light environment, optimize your health. Mm -hmm. All right, guys, you heard it from Dr. Carrie Jones. Once again, appreciate you having, having you on, Carrie. We'll do it again. But everyone, Dr. Carrie Jones, this is Dr. Mike Balkowski. We're signing off of the Red Light Report. You all have a fantastic week. Thank you for listening to the Red Light Report. If you like what you heard today, go ahead and leave us a review on iTunes and other podcast platforms to help spread the word so other people can learn about the many health, wellness, and longevity benefits of red light therapy. If you're looking for more educational content, check out our Instagram page at biolight.shop and our YouTube channel, Biolight. I'm Dr. Mike Belkowski, and I'll see you on the next episode.